All right, well, welcome back, welcome back. Uh, welcome back to the Hip Politics Podcast, uh, to all my hip politic pros out here in the world. Uh, we're the fastest growing po- podcast in Evansville, Indiana. Yes, I just yes. check that. No <laughs> um, we're shouts here for another, <laughs> shouts out to Evansville. Um, we're here with another episode this week. Thanks to you all for tuning in. Uh, you got your boy, uh, Cameron Trimble, a.k.a. Mr. Hip Politics, a.k.a. Communicator of Color, a.k.a. DC to the World. Um, unfortunately, my co-host is actually out here doing real political work and couldn't come in to, uh, for this episode, but we got uh, Michael McQuarrie, a.k.a. the DC Noob, a.k.a. the Mr. Mayor of Capitol Hill. Um, but we are still joined. The show must go on. We constantly, it, it, sometimes some of the people we're getting uh, on the podcast, you mean, hey, they got, they got things to do. They're out here trying to change the world. So whenever I can fit into their schedule, we make, we make accommodations. We try to make it happen because we really want to bring these people, uh, bring these people their voices and, and the work they're doing to the people. Uh, I am joined by my illustrious guest to my right, uh, Mr. James Kim. Yes, yes. James Kim is the executive director of Beat Global, which stands for Bridging Education and Art Together. Uh, they're a nonprofit yep. uh, based in New York, correct? Based in New York City. Based in New York City. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, it's first time really running through D.C. and... Um, God, what can I say? This place is really, really crazy. Um, so I couldn't be happy to be here and um, could not wait to actually get to know you a little bit better myself as well. Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, tuning in. So for all those that don't know, you'll obviously you'll see on the Facebook page, you'll see on, the, on, uh, on all of our platforms. We'll make sure we plug into uh, beatglobal.org so you can lo- learn a little bit more about Beat. Uh, but, but we're here to talk to that because they are doing some really, really phenomenal things. Um, I, uh, a mutual friend of ours, or a mutual friend and colleague of ours, uh, connected us, uh, and she educated. And she just all she did was send a, a link to the website and a link to like one video. Yeah. And I was like, "What is this?" Because <laughs> um, I, I, to be honest, and I am sorry for this, but I hadn't heard of you yet. Yeah. And I hadn't heard of no, Beat. And then once I dived in, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is happening all around the world. Like, <laughs> yeah. and it's been happening for, you guys are going, what, your ninth year no, this year? No, we just finished our tenth year. So, oh, tenth year. going yeah. into Because you started in, what, 20, 2010, right? Right. right so. Uh, so I'll give you the I'll give you the corporate speak of what BEAT is. BEAT is produces cross-disciplinary programs led by world-class professional artists yep. that teach the arts of beatboxing, breakdancing, music production, creative writing, emceeing and performing live. They've got three main programs, the Beat Explorers program, the Beat Breakers, kind of B-Boys and Breakdancing, yep. and Beat Rockers, Beatboxing. Yep. Uh, and then you all provide services to what really struck me that you work with um, students and students who are either blind, I've heard yep. st- and students that are deaf, and also you've gone to refugee camps, you've gone all around the inner cities. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, Beat Global? Sure. Well, um, we're just getting into our 10th year now, so that by itself is um, kind of hard to believe in doing this work for so long. Um, but we started really as a passion project. Um, I had real no intention to really start a nonprofit organization, to be honest. Um, my professional background is um, I was in event marketing when I first started my career. So, oh, we got that in common. No doubt. Yes. Yeah, so so I started pretty corporate. I started um, at Comedy Central and was producing events for them. Um, Again, this is about, what, 15 years ago or so when I first started over there. Comedy at the time was really interesting because it was actually, it had two parents. It had Time Warner and it had Viacom. Mm -hmm. There used to be two comedy channels before that and they were both dying, so they kind of came together, became Comedy Central. Mm -hmm. And at that time I was doing events and uh, I was really, really happy at that at that place. It was basically, we were like the stepchild of these two parents. And at the time we were coming out with all this amazing content. So for me, it was really about at an early age, really learning how to put elements together and put parties together, et cetera, especially coming from this sort of corporate lens. Um, what happened was that, um, 
when the Time Warner merger happened, uh, basically they were hemorrhaging money. Viacom took over and bought that 50%. So then I started working for MTV Networks and okay. I was producing events for MTV. Mm-hmm. Um, that sounds cool. It, it sounds amazing, but I, I, I kind of hated it at that point. Um, I actually was only there for maybe about six or seven months after that takeover happened, and I was just sort of really disillusioned. I didn't really like working for MTV, especially within that department. We were just, it was just really crazy. It wasn't really what I wanted to do at that point. Um, I had a friend who had moved out to Korea maybe about five years prior to that, and he went out there initially to shoot a documentary about the about b-boys in Korea and in that particular element of hip-hop and why that was sort of kind of taking hip-hop a life of is itself. huge in Korea well b-boying is huge b-boying is well I say that to say yeah. I've seen YouTube videos yeah. of breakdancing and b-boying out in, yeah out in Korea so shouts to my man Charlie out there he was out there what close to 20 years ago he wanted he went out there initially just to kind of shoot a documentary he wanted to really kind of be in that community and get an understanding mm-hmm. of like why, how, why is it b-boying in particular has really taken off in the way that it has. So he was really curious. He's from Queens too. He's a hip hop. And this guy. is early two thousands, oh, mid two thousands. This is like well, he probably went out there like late late nineties or something. Oh, really? like, you know, so why, right? I mean, he was really at the at, at just sort of at the forefront when when it just started to really take off. And mm-hmm. what was interesting is that he speaks perfect Korean and he speaks perfect English. So at the time, what was happening was there was a lot of sort of corporate partners that were like, what's going on with this B-Boy stuff? Um, And he was then putting events together through sponsorships and that sort of thing. So coming from my background, he's like, yo, I need need help, man. So that's actually the reason why I quit MTV, because I had this this option of moving to Korea and I DJ. And he was managing a club as well. I don't. I didn't have one really, man. I was just like Jay Kim, but <laughs> but but that actually says that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. You can be a J. Kim. Right. Would even, don't even have to throw the DJ in there. Yeah. Just, just J. Kim. That's, so okay. that, those are my two options. Do I stay in this corporate gig, you know, and I was just sort of getting destroyed and didn't, didn't really like it. And uh, the option was, do I move to Korea and I can DJ at the club that he was managing and also help him produce events because that's where my forte is professionally. So mm-hmm. I was like... Fuck it, I'm just gonna go do that, you know? And that was my first real introduction of getting to sort of live within a community as it was sort of blossoming. And these were all my little dudes. The B boys that I had met then, this is what, 12, 13 years ago, are now sort of the OGs of the Korean B boy scene. So the B boy Ducky and Hong Tens, who are still competing, you know, but those guys are now sort of the OG status. So we went out there and that was when uh, I was really helping him sort of produce these bigger b-boy jams, and that's when it really started to gain momentum. Um, fast forward, I moved back to New York, but I was still able to go back to Korea every summer. Uh, the, the scene had exploded to a point where they started producing a federally funded b-boy international jam called R16. Now that was one of the biggest as a com- like a competition as a, as a competition it, it was it kind of turned out to be like a hip hop summit if you will was it internally just for Koreans or was it it a, was it, it brought b boys from all over the- it was called R16 because the 16 stood for um, having representation from 16 different countries oh wow it was crazy that first year i mean we were able to not only invite b boys but the whole idea is let's look at the map, let's look at the globe and see where the dopest b-boy crews are and invite them all to Korea for that and then have a big competition. But that was like big, we did it at the Olympic Stadium every year, satellite TV, 5,000 person capacity. We, and then we invited all of our hip hop heroes as well. So not just, not just dancers, but graffiti writers. We, we, we invited at the time uh, Martha Cooper, Jamel Shabazz, mm. Joe Conzo, people who were documenting this, Jeff Chang. You know, we were like, okay, who can we come here to have like this, this, for this fellowship mm-hmm. and really have this introduction, this international b-boy community come to Korea every summer and compete. So I was able to do that for nine years. 
Um, and I really was able to kind of see the Korean hip hop scene really blow up during that time. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, this is a federally funded event. So b-boying wow. became so How ingrained. Wow, it's so crazy, right? How did you got the government to <laughs> I, see. I can understand the government, any government globally now getting on hip hop because now it's the number one, yeah. it's the number one music genre. Right, right, like right. there's so much. There, there's a clear path to financial uh, success and influence. Mm -hmm. But you're talking what? 10, more than 10, 15 yeah, it was plus about, years. This is about 13 years ago. Now. Yeah. yeah so right, right. For, the, for you to have the foresight in Korea to be federally funded, that must mean you guys really were on to something. Well, the Korean B-Boys, when they started competing on the international scene, this is way back then in the early 2000s, like people didn't really know. And then the Koreans would just show up and just do all this crazy shit. People were like, Who, where do these guys come from? You know? And that was really... Um, a way to sort of self-identify in a way where the kids were like, yo, Korean b-boys and this is who we are, word, da, 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 like kind of caricature-ish, you know, with the whole, with the glass and the kangles and the ditas and the shell toes and whatnot. But, you know, I think it was really out of respect, you know, but they really took the, that particular element and they, mm -hmm. and they kind of made it their own. Um, and the government was involved in the agency that sponsored it was the Korean Tourism Organization. So like if we can make Koreans and the Korean youth look cool through b-boying, then we want to support you. We want to make sure that we can get all these different kids and different countries to come and compete for that particular weekend. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I really saw the struggle. I really saw what it meant to be an artist, you know, especially if you're a dancer. I mean, it's hard anywhere in any city, um, especially if you're a b-boy, if you're part of a crew. I mean, you can be, you know, rehearsing, practicing for like six months for a big jam. Let's say if you, even if you win it, I mean, maybe you'll, you'll, you'll pocket like $1,000 or something like that. So I really saw the struggle and I really was uh, an advocate and I was really pushing to really get them out there, get them more work, get them more gig, get them more corporate gigs, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I was also managing b-boys as well you mm -hmm. know so okay. I was kind of involved um, mm -hmm. peripherally through the event but also very intimately through the relationship that I had gained mm -hmm. through going back to Korea every year um, and that was a little bit of a precursor for how the whole organization started actually um, we were invited to go on tour. There's a London-based company called... Like some of the B-Boys that you were managing? Or yes. was it a specific crew? Um, had you formed... You had, it wasn't Beat yet. So had you formed... Yet. Was this like a, a dedicated crew that you managed or they were already existed? This was a special crew that we kind of put together. Um, we went on tour for a month, hosted and with the breaking convention. They're London-based, non-verbal sort of urban dance theater... Um, mm -hmm. showcase that they did. Um, it blew up so much that they decided to take it out of London and go on the road and, and take it you know, on tour in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, that's when we formed this group. They're called Myozung, AKA Project Soul, and I was managing this group, basically also road managing them. Um, we went on the road for a month. We rocked 15 shows all around the UK. Um, Scotland, Ireland, the, the whole thing. And we were on the road with, I would say, about 30 dancers from all over the world. And I, I was really fortunate that Ken Swift was on that tour with us. He was with the Seven Gems. Ken Swift is, you know, second generation B-boy, been dancing for, mm -hmm. what, 35 years now. I mean, he's a real icon in the culture, you know. So really blessed to have met him. And that's, he's also, you know, um, like a really instrumental role in sort of helping us start what we did back then. Mm -hmm. um, so what was really amazing about that tour was that we sold it out. And these weren't club gigs, my dude. They were like full on theaters, 12 to 1500 people. I mean, we felt like legit rock stars. Were they, were these, wow. Yeah. yeah that's dope. And this is still <laughs> early, this is still like. Yeah, this is what, this is In what, the thousands. This is, yeah, this is still pre-2010 yeah. beat formula. Oh yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. This is uh, right around, this is 2009, I think, was when that okay. tour happened actually. So, mm -hmm. right, right, I think right around then. Um, and what was amazing, again, I had been doing all this work in Korea and in Asia, and then we had now had just seen the impact of what we were doing and how popular it was in Europe. And of course, we had known, you know, it's just really revered in hip hop, etc. Um, but I was like, man, this is crazy. And I was talking to Kenny about this, you know, I'm like, here we are, right? We got dope tour buses, we got real good hotel rooms that we getting taken care of. And back in New York, where all this started, like, there's 
there's nothing. You know what I mean? Like, it's not funded. I mean, it's not even, it's completely ignored. You know, even when you're wanting, let's say if you wanted to learn how to break, you kind of had to get pulled in by somebody that you knew. Maybe you can go to a dance studio and take like a hip hop choreography class or something like that. But there was no authentic way to really learn how to b-boy, especially from other b-boys who really authentically represent the mm -hmm. culture. And that right there was the catalyst. Um, I was like, yo, Kenny, we go back to New York. We got to do something about this, my man. Like, let's start a b-boy program. And for me, it was really important. It's still one of the things that I want to do. I was like, we need to start in the schools. You know, I want to be in the schools. You know, I would love for us to sort of like eventually get b-boying to be recognized as like an after-school alternate sport. Even you know what I mean? Well, crews represent like like Leatherman jackets, yo. You guys, so, you know, not to fast forward, <laughs> uh -huh. but you all must have had, you must have had a had major impact because you know now b-boying is about to be in the yeah. Olympics. Oh my god! And I was like, where y'all been, man? I mean, <laughs> I've been, be been waving this flag for so but long. But I don't, man. I don't want to fast forward too yeah. far past. So, in, so in 2010, you come back to New York, right? And it's this might have been because we were on tour in in the, in the spring, and then I came back in the fall, right? So mm -hmm. it was all in 2009 when when the first idea sort of came into fruition, and being that I come from this corporate marketing world. And thank God I didn't necessarily come from like the nonprofit world because I can make a deck, I can write stuff, you know, and taking photos, et cetera. So when we so got all back my to politicals out there, please get your deck game. Yo, up. get your like deck that game. is that the key to so much money out here is just making sure the deck <laughs> looks right. Like I, I'm the same way. Yeah, I, I, I go. I tell people the moment they send me stuff. Do you know why you aren't getting money? Your mm -hmm. deck looks kind of trash. Yeah, but <laughs> but I feel that that's that that's an underrated that's an underrated skill to bring to somebody, if, right. especially if you're trying to blow something up that people may not have exact equivalents to. Right. So if right, you can right. explain it in a way and present it in a way that they can understand. Of course, of course. And I didn't know anything about like writing grants or anything like yeah. that but I'm like yo I know how to get this corporate money you know so I wrote this deck and um, I was able to put it in front of Puma and Puma was the first corporation that sponsored that program way back when in 2009 we started in the South Bronx um, at this high school and uh, so did you start at the Lavelle school no we started at the Bronx Academy of Letters in the South Bronx oh okay yeah so Lavelle happened very soon afterwards okay um, but when we first started Kenny was like listen man number one I'll tell you something you're not the first one to try and start something like this. We, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I respect you and I like what you want to do, so I'll, I'll even teach that first year. You know, like, mm -hmm. I'll be the lead instructor. I was like, oh, my God, let's get this popping, you know? So I was able to include him in uh, B-Boy Whack 1. He was the assistant instructor who has now moved up. He's still with us. He's our lead instructor now. But we started in the South Bronx with that one program. And Puma was able to support us. They were able to, you know, give us some funding. They gave us some sneakers and some T-shirts. Um, and the program just blew up. Kids loved it. Um, and from there, I was like, okay, well, I think we're on to something here. You know? So when, when you say the program blew up or the kids loved it, was mm -hmm. this something they were getting, like, credit for? Uh, no, it was just started as an after-school program. After-school program. After program. How many kids yeah. in that first... It was like 12 to 15 kids in that first program. And it was volunteers. They voluntarily were able to sign up to do it. Yeah. So any, any kid who wanted to do it, they could, they could just do it, you know. Um, so obviously they didn't know who Kenny was or anything like that. But once they started to get into the program, they were like, man, this is so dope. They did, a, you know, like a performance at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really how it started. Just a really small passion project because I saw that there was no ways to access this you know to even access these you know these practitioners someone like kenny who really not only represents the culture but who helped shape the culture in his own way you know like i think that's really important so it was became much more even at that point still more than just a b-boy program when it show you the steps this is an indian step this is a sixth step etc but kenny would tell you what moves were made, what song was playing when that move was made, what b-boy made it, you know, he can give you all this context, which was so dope, because we were also kind of demystifying what the kids thought hip-hop was, you know what I mean? So you got Ken Swift kind of at the helm. So many kids <laughs> don't realize they all, they just see, oh, rappers and producers, no, b-boying, yeah. 
DJ mm. and MC. Like, mm. you talk when you say like the pillars of, of hip hop, oh. of the culture. B boying mm. is just, I mean, and not to mention we're in the South Bronx. Bronx. We're like where, literally where, where hip hop really, really started. started. <laughs> like this is real. Like over there. Like this was the where the roller break, and this is where we hung right. out. Is da da da. You know. So I mean, even me was getting this like this first class education about this whole social context and sort of where all this started and sort of now we're, we're look at we're, look at where we're at. I, mm-hmm. I have a question mm-hmm. um, before we get into kind of what you all are doing now. Mm-hmm. Are, are you Korean American? I am Korean. So coming into the Bronx, how mm-hmm. did how was how has that been received? Because it, it yeah. just shows how global hip hop is and oh, how, how impactful it is. But you're going into the Bronx, into <laughs> a very black and Latino area, yeah, heavily yeah, yeah. black and Latino area, dealing in hip hop. Yeah, yeah. And but you're one of the you're bringing one of the founding pillars of yeah. hip hop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to the community. How was that received? I think more than me being self conscious or even being self aware about that. Really, it was just focusing on. This program and the kids in giving an avenue for these artists that also make some money as well, you know. So for me, I just thought that was like really fortunate that we had a school that was willing to take us on. And to be honest, we're like, listen, you know, we're gonna self fund it. <laughs> we're gonna give oh. the kids sneakers, and the, the schools oh, so are like, like cool. the schools are like, word, yo, come, come, please, you know. But I think what is significant is the fact that we were in the South Bronx, and I think that was really important to sort of even, you know, the significance and the symbolism of that, you know. So I think it was really powerful. I never really think about it, me as an Asian person going into these neighborhoods, you know. Um, but if if anything, it was like, yo, we want to bring this program to you guys, free of charge. And we're gonna have one of the most incredible icons come and be your instructor, you know. So it's mm-hmm. like, or bring MJ and teach you how to play basketball or whatever it is, you know what I mean? So no matter for, who, who, yeah, I don't like, care what you are. If you bring somebody like that, right, 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 who, right, who's of the culture and one of the, yeah. one of the icons, one of the found, well, yeah, I mean, one of the pioneers, yeah. Right, right. That's so true. for me, it was just about man, I can't wait to get this thing off the ground, and really, I'm really, I was really curious to see how it was going to be received because you know, kids now they might look at breaking as like some old dude stuff. You know what I mean? Like, so, <laughs> you know, I like, think a lot, especially <laughs> now, and even when you started, and you're talking 2009, 10, getting getting started. So we were, we had probably just really broken into the social media era when that. Really, almost. Yeah, 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 yeah MySpace was still. Facebook, yeah. Facebook, <laughs> Facebook was around then, but oh, right, right, still. Right, right. But, I, I, but the internet was way more robust by that time. Mm-hmm. In the sense of that, they're always looking for the kind of the path to the glory, mm-hmm. whether that be the financial glory or the the like. Oh, I can understand if I'm an MC, I'm gonna make money and be famous. Mm-hmm. I, I can understand if I'm. A producer, I can make money and be famous and be impactful. Even if I'm a DJ yeah. or someone else in the culture, yeah, I, yeah. I can see how breaking a everyone is, doesn't even feel like I can dance. You know, <laughs> they can dance or yeah, dance yeah. that well in that type. Like yeah, there's yeah. a difference between bre- dancing and breaking, obviously. So right, right, right. And then also, what's my path? I guess to success as yeah. a as a, as a b boy. Right, right. Uh, so I, I could, I could definitely see how you may be some resistance, at least for the, the younger culture who didn't, yeah, yeah, didn't see some of these early '80s, '90s movies and see how super influential it was right, right. at the start of hip hop. And I also, you know, uh, I think that the dance has evolved so incredibly much since, you know, since the '80s or whatnot. Mm-hmm. So I feel like people's perceptions of it, once they can see Kenny, once they can see Wack do their thing. They're like, oh, and then you can kind of very directly see how influential b-boying has become in all of sort of pop culture and dance. I think mm-hmm. they always borrow from that cult, from our culture, mm-hmm. especially some of the moves and the style, all that, you know. So I think there are ways for the kids to sort of make that connection into that world and they can see things mm-hmm. are familiar and be like, oh, cool. Um, but I think it was more curiosity rather than, let's say, intimidation or they didn't they didn't really know, but they were curious enough to try. Um, and I feel like that's really, you know, that's all you really need to do was at least a captive audience with some curiosity that they brought to the table and, of course, their young energy, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, fast forward to now. You mm-hmm. all, um, one of the things that jumped out init- initially, uh, yeah. just reading up about, uh, about Be Global, is you're working with 
These kids with autism in school yeah, for the yeah. blind, like explain that correlation. So like and how you got into that and how you're helping them. Like that is Yeah. So what's crazy is that so we started that so in the fall of two thousand nine we, we, we launched the Beat Breaker program and at that point, um, I had gone through the whole process of like having to talk with the school superintendents and the principals and sort of convince them that this is something that they might want to to look at etc um and i had a friend that was a teacher at the lavelle school for the blind and what was really interesting is that she had asked me if i was available to go dj the school dance um and that was really the catalyst for the beat rockers program and it really only happened like one semester after we had launched beat breakers so i was able to oh, so you didn't launch beat breakers rock you didn't no so these things are happening just sort of like you know the, the 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 first program happened i had the opportunity to go to the lavelle school for the blind and, and dj and that's where i was so moved uh all the kids at lavelle are blind or have some visual impairment and i would say the, the majority of them have multiple disabilities. It could be, um, you know, uh, developmental, it could be physical. Um, but what I hadn't seen was a gymnasium full of kids um, in that population rocking out to music. And that for me was probably the most inspiring, most one of the most moving sort of moments in, the, you, in the whole story. You, so you said your friend that brought you there and you just kind of observed what they were well, doing and said like, oh, we can, this well, can she, make sense? Well, or? she invited me to DJ the school dance, right? So uh -huh. here I am in the gymnasium and before I got there, the kids had sort of commandeered the, the iPod already. So I walk into the gymnasium and you know, the school dance, the kids are in like their suits and dresses and being all cute. Uh -huh. um, but I had never seen kids um, in that population react to music in the way that they're reacting. And the dope part is that, like, a lot of the kids didn't really know how to, like, dance properly because they couldn't see, you know what I mean? And they're young and whatever. So how they were reacting was really just, just so visceral. It's like the music is hitting them, and then they're just spazzing out or doing whatever. I mean, it was so live. It was so crazy. It was so moving. And I was just like, wow, like, this is the power of music, right? And this is how powerful and you're DJing it is. Music At that food. point, you know, because uh, I didn't want to take, I didn't want to be like, yo, back off, man, I'm here. You know what I'm saying? So uh, at that point, I was just sort of observing what was happening in the gymnasium. Uh -huh. And I also had this idea, um, I had worked with so many hip hop artists at that point, I thought, man, it would be so dope if we could bring like a beatboxer in and do a showcase for these kids because I wanted them to just bug out. I just thought it'd be like this super crazy audio magic trick where the kid's like, wait, what's going on? And be like, yo, that's one dude. And he's making all that with his mouth. That's it. So I just wanted to bring that opportunity where I'm like, man, get some beatboxes in here and just like bug the kids out with, with, with their performance. Um, but we had just launched the B-Boy the B -boy program the semester prior to that. I was like, man, let's just teach the kids how to beatbox rather than just giving them an hour showcase. You know, So that was my whole inspiration for that. Um, I called my man Taylor McFerrin. Um, he's an amazing beatboxer, producer. Um, and he was just like, my, my man, a beatboxing program for blind kids? He's like, I'm in, you know? <laughs> and we were at that point at a very early stage even able to galvanize a lot of the professional New York City beatboxing community, you know? Mm -hmm. So we had a very early classes. We had Kenny Muhammad in there and Taylor was in there. We had like Chesney Snow in there. Um, Adam Mata was a teacher. So we were able to just like, I very quickly got familiar with the professional New York City beatboxing community. Um, so same kind of thing. I wrote a deck. And then I, and I approached um, the principal and the superintendent. They didn't even know what beatboxing was. So I brought my laptop, brought some samples of what it is that was. I brought Taylor with me. Uh -huh. And they're like, all right, this sounds, this sounds interesting. You know, this sounds really interesting. So um, we couldn't do an after-school program because the busing was all crazy. So they shifted some of the scheduling. And we, were, we actually were able to do like an in-school beatboxing like program. And we called it Beat Rockers. And wow. yeah. so you, like, I just, I've, I hear so much yeah. social because the last part I wanted to ask before we go into a couple of uh, my last few questions yeah. was also that you brought 
some of your programs to Rikers Island? Oh yeah, we uh, we've been doing a program where um, we would bring a producer MC into Rikers Island and work with incarcerated youth, um, just giving them an ad an avenue to to write rhymes and to and to be creative. Um, there was some activity outside of our control that prohibited us from going in there with more regularity but you know we do work with formerly incarcerated youth mm -hmm. um you know we were trying to get back into rikers apparently what happened was um someone from another organization tried to sneak in uh like a blade uh, Clint Perfect. yeah so and basically they shut, shut everything, everything down. down they're like yeah, none of you guys it. can come in anymore you no, know i get it <laughs> but um no, because I just hear so many different things. Of I, I, I hear social change. Yeah. I hear like community building. Mm. I hear like expansion mm. of the culture, mm. global expansion mm. of the culture, mm. being able to bring kind of corporate and education into it. Like there's just so many cross sections yeah. with one of the pillars of hip hop being kind of the foundation. Yeah. And it's funny you said uh, you were told at the beginning that people have tried to formalize this before. And yeah. Now, yeah. Going into your tenth year <laughs> with the beat rockers, beat breakers, yeah. and beat explorers. Yeah, because you've been to Jordan, correct? Yeah, we were um, the refugee camp in Jordan. Yeah, we were able to through partnership with um, uh, the UNHCR. We were able to. That's the United Nations. Yeah, it's the refugee, refugee agency, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so we were able to. I, I took. Um, man, some of the most incredible dancers. We took Lilu from France. We took Menno from uh, from the Netherlands. We took uh, B Girl Sophie from Germany. I brought B Boy Wack One from New York. Um, but most importantly, not just going into Jordan. We went to Amman first, and mm -hmm. we we uh, met up with the local dancers there. So the there is a B Boy culture there. There is a hip hop culture there. We wanted to make sure that we can bring local dancers with us. We ended up going to Zatari. Zatari is the second biggest refugee camp in the world. I think it's like 120,000 people in there. So through the partnership with the UNHCR, we were able to take our crew, the local Amman-based uh, B-boys and B-girls, mm -hmm. and do a week of workshopping and worked with all the uh, young folks out there, which was, which was incredible, you know. Also something that we want to continue to do, um, you know, really, galvanize the international b-boy community um, and see what we can do in terms of bringing um, bringing the culture into the camps as well wow so. can i just shake your hand like, this is uh wow this is it, mind you i to, to the audience I, I definitely did my research and read it but it to hear kind of the vibrancy mm -hmm. uh and you kind of telling the story behind it mm -hmm. is it just shows the power of hip-hop absolutely it shows the power of hip-hop it shows mm -hmm. the power of hip-hop to bring change mm. um to bring social change to bring like i mean you're talking about going to refugee camps and yeah. rikers island working with students oh, uh, yeah. inner city students blind right. students mm. um I, uh, various I, I just i just wow it, it, <laughs> it, 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 i'm sorry i'm not usually at a loss for words <laughs> but uh it's just such a cool story yeah um, how can people get involved or if they want to maybe, I don't know what, they either want to yeah. maybe bring a class to them to wherever yeah. they're at or yeah, yeah. say they want to, they're really good beatboxers, breakers, yeah. they want to get involved. Maybe they just want to help yeah. direct some corporate dollars. Like, absolutely. I, I know they can go to beatglobal.org. Beatglobal.org for sure. Absolutely. Um, but we're always looking, me, like me personally, um, I actually want to do more of like an international sort of tour. I want to go to the biggest jams, whether they be b-boy jams, whether they be beatboxing jams, etc. Um, and we really want to like work and collaborate with different artists and individuals from different cities, from different parts of the world, um, and start programming there. You know, I feel like we want to make sure that it's always going to be led locally. You know what I mean? Not to say that we're going into any country or city and know what that country or city is all about, but I feel like if there are um, artists, b-boys, et cetera, beatboxers, et cetera, that are interested in starting something or a program or even a small program, um, I want to be there to really support and help in that. You know, I feel like you just mentioned um, the power of hip hop is, man, it, it's, it's, it's so deep and varied in terms of how we can help, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it depends who you're working with. For us, what's emerged in the last 10 years is, well, how can you use this motivation? The kids really love this art form, whatever it is, you know, whether it be dancing, whether it be, whether it be um, beatboxing or rhyming. And, and for us, we're trying to make these connections and really 
really being clear that through the creation of this art or learning a skill that they can also be solving problems at the same time. Um, a good example of that has been, uh, you know, we're really looking at beatboxing as a tool for speech therapy. We're really trying to get um, a lot of research behind that. Uh, we want mm. to, uh, yeah, if you think about it, I mean, what's language? No, yeah. You know, what's language but a bunch of weird sounds, sounds we make? Exactly that uh, have agreed upon meaning. Right, right. And beatboxing, I think, it transcends language in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, we're, and we've converted our b-boy program into a health program where we can actually get data. We have these uh, heart rate monitors. We can get data. Uh, we can give parents health reports, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it's never going to be a bait and switch with the kids. are always going to learn how to break. But we're saying, man, the more you break, you know, the healthier that you can get. You know, the more that you beatbox, if you have issues with speech, it's going to help you practice with that, you know? Wow. I mean, if you think about emceeing and writing, it's like career yeah. development also because, like, as a young MC, it's like, Oh, young it's, man. It's, it's teaching you uh, confidence. It's teaching you diction. It's teaching you vocabulary. It's teaching you how to present to a crowd. Yeah, absolutely. One of the, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've been in communications and marketing for mm -hmm. going on, graduate, yeah, for almost 20 years now. Mm -hmm. Graduated like 16, I graduated a while ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> from college, <laughs> been in the game, and I just took another public speaking class. Yeah. Um, oh, like maybe so six or seven months ago. Yeah, yeah. And you just realize, like, I'm in there with people in their 40s, 50s, 60s mm. in some of my class, in mm. addition to people in their 20s and 30s. Right, right. Who are like, all realize whether they're corporate, they're lawyers, they're nonprofit, mm. um, they're social activists. People realize like how many people struggle with public speaking Absolutely. or presenting to groups. So when you talk about an MC, mm. one person, one mic, and it's like I gotta rock this crowd. Whether That's it's it. two people, in, I mean, right. I've been on tour right, in, right. With, with artists where I've up and coming artists, and they've yeah. got five, seven people in a crowd, or they've got a room full of five or six hundred people, Absolutely. and being able to kind of control that. So yeah, there's yeah. Like you said, with this, um, how beatboxing essentially, yeah, could help with speech. Like that, oh, there definitely absolutely. needs. Because I think the next level is the research, right? Whether it's through the CDC or whether it's through uh, or you, whether it's through um, universities. Yeah. But if it's agreed upon research, yeah, absolutely. And now you know how many, that's, and now I've got data to back it up. Uh, now yeah. you both can go get brands Jeez. and federally funded dollars you get it you, you get, get it the, yeah oh, absolutely I I absolutely we need to legitimize i see i see, oh. I see the connection <laughs> Once you, that's all the yeah. people money moves yeah. when there's there's precedent absolutely it's like i i people just don't throw money just because they feel good i mean right. some people do but most smart <laughs> money doesn't go to just because i feel something right right prove right. me prove it to me absolutely so when it's recent and proof in this it's research like you yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. you got proof of concept in terms of like the, through the success you're and if you can back that up with any kind of data absolutely like, i can yeah, see yeah. that your next 10 years even be on 10 times more fruitful than these first 10. Right, right. Yeah, like but it's I just see. really about making these connections, connections that, that, yeah. that exist already. But I think, you know, we want to make sure that we can legitimize this in, in, in whatever capacity it is that we want to see it make improvements in kids' lives. You know? Well, I hope, hopefully mm -hmm. with the, the, the micro portion we can do by just kind of getting this story out there to our audience and like Word, and letting that. people know. Uh, when we have our uh, summit next year, I definitely want to invite you back. And, um, I would love, love that. To, yeah, I'll to bring some. Connect. I'll bring some heavy bring hitters with me. That's the, hey, <laughs> hey, hey! You heard that? That's on wax. That's on video. <laughs> um, as as we're um, kind of building toward, we're like the next big iteration outside of the podcast and our, our stuff we do on social is the hip hop political summit. Mm. So that's that's Get been it. something that uh, been. Dang, I guess I'll let the cat out of... Well, I've already kind of known that. <laughs> it's happening. It's, 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 what's happening? It's happening. There's, 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 I, I got like this. I got decks out there. <laughs> I got decks out there. Um, but um, I want to um, wrap up with yeah. the hardest questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, first, when did you fall in love with hip-hop? Man, probably... Junior high school, I think I was uh, probably more in influenced. York, right? I grew up in Chicago and I moved to New York when I was fifteen. Born so I moved in Chicago. To, I was born in Chicago. Oh, for real? I moved. To, so I moved to New York in that golden era. I think I moved to New York in like ninety two, <laughs> ninety one, ninety two, something like that. And I was just like, whoa, coming from Chicago to New York, you know. So for me, I think I was just really influenced by more, probably more native tongues, you know, mm -hmm. like obviously Biggie. 
Um, but you know, Tribe and Dela, you know, the, those. We had those a little bit of. If you watching the video, there's a few <laughs> Tribe videos in the back. <laughs> kind of new. Yeah, Whatever. yeah. So I think way back, way back when, I think, uh, especially moving into New York, where I was now in the thick of it, and again looking back, I was like, man. Um, Look like that era at that time and me being in New York and me being 15 and moving from Chicago and kind of seeing it and just like it, I was blown away you know just not only culturally moving from one city to the next but also the music you know so I and and there's there's no getting that, away from it that, you know around that time yeah. you're talking New York still had had hip hop on lock kind of thing. You're talking oh, yeah. 91, 92 is just the West Coast hip hop is just like because mm. what Doggy Style dropped in like 93, mm. Chronic dropped 92. So pre 92, 93, and, and we only had like maybe I see a few things on yeah, the West, yeah, yeah, but yeah. New York, like it was you said, with that yeah, yeah. of it, like you had hardcore stuff going. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you had, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, yeah. I mean, that's a good time, especially it's a good at time. 50, being, you said being 15, so you're you're super impressionable. Like, Yo, <laughs> what is that? You're super, super impressionable. Yeah, yeah, I got yeah. it. I got it. Okay. <laughs> That's a good... Yeah, it makes sense to fall in love with hip-hop, yeah. hip-hop around that time. Um, and so now the hardest question was something we ask all of our uh, guests. Top five. Oh, man. I knew you were going to do So this is your top five. There's no wrong answer. I may challenge you if you say something crazy. But uh, <laughs> some people have thrown out some like, how is that person in your top five? But it's still your top five. Well, I'm going to go with Biggie number one. I mean, okay. I feel like. Okay, we agree on that. We're good, we're good with that. Um, even even with, I, I tell people all the time, that is that is the how good Biggie was. Is that oh, man. two legit, two projects, If you 2.25 if you count. Like, right, um, right, right. The, the Pulse Humans project, but because there's two or three songs I like on there, but mm. really two al- two albums or two and a half because they got the double disc, but, right? The double disc, <laughs> but um, <laughs> boy, I listen to Biggie probably once a week still. Oh, of course, with streaming, man. like Come I on, got, man. yeah, I got at least one or two Biggie songs on <laughs> rotation, so I feel Absolutely. you there. So we got one, who's a <sighs> tribe? I mean, you know, so um, you're counting tribe as a well, piece the fife. I mean, but I feel like tip. And uh, I mean, I feel like at, at that time, too, because I think I was more of like an artsy kid, too. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. So they, they really appealed to me in terms of their sound. And coming from Chicago, too, I just felt like, man, they just like th- the way that 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 tip rhymes and fife and that sort of that energy together. Mm-hmm. I, I was just like, man, these are my guys, you know. Um, so I couldn't say I would say. I would have to put them as tribe, not necessarily no, as it. tip. You know One of mean? our other our, our guests, we guess we had a few weeks ago. Yeah. Through Outcast, and then was like, I was like, they wanted to say Andre three thousand. He's like, no, actually Outcast, because if yeah, if it just Andre had came out, he's like, I don't know if I'd have fell in love with Outcast or just mm. big boy. So I'll give you tribe as <laughs> so you got three more. Yeah, but then the other one might see. So not even one particular MC Beastie Boys. They were a big influence on me as well growing up, you know. Um, Peace to MCA. MC, yeah, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. Peace MCA. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I feel like, man, I, get an, I gotta give shots to Kendrick, what he's doing right now. Okay. You know. I can give you that. Um, give you that. I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw a curveball at you. My last one. He's a Korean American MC. His name is Dumbfounded. He's based out in L.A. Interesting. Um, he's, Dumb- he's he's active now. Yeah, he's doing his thing now. I mean, he's got he's got a pretty big social media following. He's been in a couple films, and you know, he does this and that. Um, he was in that movie Body. He was basically playing himself. He was like, because he did. He's in, he was like heavy in the battle rap scene. So if you go to King of the Dot, any of those things, you look oh, up yeah, Dumbfounded, yeah. Uh, Dead, Dumbfounded, Dead, D, like Dead at the end, D E A D. Look him up. My man is right, real. My man got crazy, crazy bars. Like and he's a, he's a, is he? Does he do songs or is he a battle rapper? No, no, no. He well, he that's really how he put his name on the map, battle rapping, because he would just smoke dudes. Um, but he's definitely got a couple albums out. He's uh, he's like my little brother, and I really respect what he's been doing. He's been grinding for so long and so hard. Shout out to Dumbfounded. Dumbfounded. So please, make sure if you're I'll not familiar, I'll make sure I put a link. Just want to throw a little bit of curveball in no, there. Me being hey, a Korean American, I'm saying it's your top five. Yeah. yeah, in, yeah. In, 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 <laughs> I mean, I guess it, by default, me being a uh, African American 
and growing up like, oh, this is our culture, but yeah. hip hop is, and that's that's kind of the whole platform of hip politics is mm. that it's politics and culture for the hip hop generation. Mm. Um, There's a good documentary out. It's been out for a little while, but it's called Bad Rap, and it's a mm-hmm. documentary about uh, I one. about uh, Asian American rappers trying to break into the trying to break into the game. It features dumbfounded. It actually featured um, Aquafina, who's, Aquafina, who's yeah, doing yeah. this thing now. Jen in there? The, uh, no, Jen is not in there. Um, but that please, was, that yeah, was, yeah. I, Jen, I mean, hey, I'm sorry, I'm a little. Jen's a little smart more though, man, because you know he did his thing and he, he learned Chinese, and that was, was. I was like, man, you know, but he was with you know Rough Riders, but he went out. It, it didn't really commercially work for him, but he was smart, so he was like, I'm just gonna go out to China. China. He's like, there's, huge. A billion, there's a billion heads he out is, there. And I was like, he <laughs> is yo, huge. so shots to I Jen. mean, he's still, yeah. to me, he goes down as like, remember, um, uh, what was it, Freestyle Friday? Mm. To me, he's still the Freestyle Friday champ. So I want per- you to. He's think. my personal Freestyle Friday champ. Yeah. So my but, homework was also go, 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 go YouTube Dumbfounded too, because if you're a Jen fan, Dumbfounded is also, I mean, he's nasty, but he he's nasty because he also would drop these punchlines on you. And I think that's kind of the most line. powerful, is you get you the know, whole crowl to laugh. Punch, I'm a punchline guy because yeah. one of my top fives, which I never get agreement on, mm. but if I explain it makes sense, it's fab. Fabulous. Mm. He's in my personal top five. Okay, right. Both... Yeah. Of people I like, and if you just if I had to say like just top five lyricists or rappers is Fab because like mm. to me he is like the ultimate punchline, mm. verbal king, like right metaphor, word. analogy mm. king. Like yeah. if you ever just okay, yeah, you get I like that <laughs> commercially people are like, oh he's girl rap that's how he made millions, mm. but he made his name and how he stays so relevant. I yeah. mean him he's still super active now and, mm. and still hot like a top kind of hip hop pioneer. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Low key 42. Yeah. <laughs> but been doing it like been doing it close to you know what I mean? Yeah. Been doing it almost close to 20 years like yeah, came yeah, out. Yeah. I remember he I still remember the first day like I lived in DC on two, um September 11th. That was when he dropped and Blueprint dropped. That was his mm. debut album, but Fab is a punch line king. So if you if Dumbfounded has punch lines, <laughs> yeah, yeah. any rapper out there has punch lines, they, they got me. They got okay. They got me. Okay, so got I, it, got I can it. start listening to that because uh, I I, I, always I want to have a later conversation with you after oh, you guys. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, when I see you again, I'm, I'm gonna check it out this week. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It, probably tonight on the way back. I'm gonna Google it and and uh, on, on my ride home. Yes, yes, but um. <laughs> James, I want to thank you. Thank you for so much for having uh, for Absolutely. being on, on on the podcast. Uh, sorry, my co-host couldn't be here. Uh, Mike McQuarrie, you'll definitely meet him yeah. soon in the future. Um, if you wanted to, a this is I mean it's hip hop, so you got to give your shout outs mm-hmm. and then uh, just drop your information on how people can either stay in contact on yes. social or yeah, yes. um, with Beat Global or yourself. Yeah. And so Obviously, forth. check out the website um, www.beatglobal.org. You know, or Insta Beat Global. Uh, Twitter be global um, and uh, if you are interested in maybe starting something in your city in your country I'm open I want to listen I want to meet y'all please email me james at beatglobal.org super easy okay um, and then everybody here make sure you check in um, please tell a friend to tell a friend share leave comments like helps helps us score on iTunes and mm. Stitcher and all the other platforms we're on. Sound we kind of kick it off on SoundCloud. Mm. We're just um, moving over to YouTube as well for the video. Follow us at Hip Politics Podcast on Insta, or um, we're on the Hip Politics News Network, so you can follow us Hip Politics News on Insta, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, we've got a upcoming events. If you're going to be in D.C. on the 30th or 31st of July, we're going to be co-hosting with several different organizations from the Young Democrats to 10 Friends, a few uh, local elected officials, uh, kind of back-to-back night, uh, back-to-back watch parties of the Democratic debate. Um, but it wouldn't be hip politics unless there's a DJ, so we're going to be DJing in between commercial breaks Let's and before it. and after. Um, but just a little uh, kind of a mix and blend of the culture. So if you're out in D.C., it's free. Uh, We'll have kind of uh, the link will be up when you see or hear this podcast. Just go on any of our platforms. You'll be able to get uh, to be able to RSVP for that. Um, You can follow me and Mr. Cameron Calvin, Mr. Cameron Calvin, on Insta and Twitter. 
um, DC Nuke 90, uh, from my co-host Mike McQuarrie on Insta and Twitter. Um, just, wow, we learned something else. We learned, <laughs> we, we got to another, uh, another great organization, a great man in the culture. Um, really honored to have you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I like your top five. Good, good, <laughs> solid top five. I Let learned something. Yeah, yeah. I learned something. <laughs> agreed with something, and made me think about something. So that's that's that's, that's a that's a quality top five right there. Oh man. Um, <laughs> thanks for all. Thanks for sitting with the conversation. Uh, again, again. Um, um, Hip politics podcast. Next week we also gonna have a couple cool guests. But thank you for tuning in. Uh, and we're out. Peace. Yes, peace. Peace. Shorty, you the sh- no filter. IG pick, no filter. You can get the d- no filter. I'ma tell her how it is, no filter. Shorty, you the sh- no filter. IG pick, no filter. You can get the d- no filter. I'ma tell her how it is, no filter. Sick, man. That's sick. Oh, you got me.